host. My name is Jennifer Bennett. I'm the Senior Manager of Education and Training here at Volunteer Match. And I want to welcome you to one of our nonprofit insight series with David Stiers from the Presidio Institute. From partnership to impact to forging, convening, and sorry, <laughs> and funding cross-sector cross collaboration. Um, we have David Stiers with us. Good morning, David. Good morning, Jennifer. Before I pass it over to David, I did just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. First of all, all of you are on an automatic mute this morning, so you don't need to worry about any background noise on your part. Just because we can't hear your voice doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. You should see a GoToWebinar toolbar in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You can open that up. You should see the word questions um, with either a plus sign or an arrow sign next to it. Uh, that's how you can type in your questions as we go through today. Dave is also going to ask you to chat in today as well. So underneath the questions tool, you will see the chat tool. You can open that up and chat as well. So we'll be keeping track of both of those, uh, the questions um, and the chat as we go through today. I'm also going to be live tweeting. So if you're on Twitter and would like to join in the conversation or ask a question there, you can do so using the hashtag VMLearn, like volunteer match learn. And uh, we are recording today's session, and uh, David has made his slides available as well, so you'll be getting a follow-up email from Volunteer Match with that information, where to find the recording and where to find the slides. Um, all right, without further ado, I'm going to pass the screen over to David and uh, let him get started. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Again, it's Jennifer said, my name is David Stiers, and I um, work here at the Presidio Institute. I am a native of Hickory, North Carolina, if you're wondering where my accent may be from, although I lived over 20 years in Washington, D.C. before moving to the San Francisco Bay Area about three years ago, and um, I currently live here in San Francisco, but getting ready to move to El Cerrito um, the first of the year. I um, love talking about volunteering because one of my favorite aspects about volunteering is being able to meet new people and actually I got my job here at the Presidio Institute through a volunteer activity where I met a fellow co-worker who when he heard about this position opening up sent the job announcement to me and so um, volunteering actually led to paid employment for me here at the Presidio Institute. Also um, have known Volunteer Match for many many years um, particularly um, when I worked for over eight years for the Points of Light Foundation from 2000-2007 um, and I um, somewhat loved being able to continue the type of work I was doing there um, here in terms of the goal um, and mission at the Points of Light Foundation at that time was to engage more people more effectively in volunteer service to help solve serious social problems. And what we're doing here at the Presidio Institute is trying to figure out how to help people build collaborations to help solve a serious social problems and particularly working across sector and any group of volunteers by its very nature is probably a cross sector group that you have volunteers from other nonprofits from business from foundations academia government and so what we want to do today is talk about how to build those effective collaborations I am actually sitting um, at the Presidio in San Francisco. Um, my office is in the lower um, sort of left-hand corner of this picture with a view of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, unfortunately, it does not look like this today um, because um, it is cloudy and rainy, which we desperately need here in California. But um, if you ever get to San Francisco, please come see us at the Fort Scott um, campus at the Presidio and you can come hopefully on a clear day and enjoy the view of the Golden Gate Bridge. And again the Presidio Institute um, is part of the Presidio Trust which um, manages the National Park here at the Presidio and building off the public-private partnership that saved the Presidio as a national park and we're wanting to be able to provide transformational experiences that really in 
encourage and empower people to make positive change in their local communities and certainly volunteers are a key critical part of that. Um, feel free to visit our website, institute.presidio.gov for more information. We also recently launched an online education platform called Leaderosity.com um, where we're going to be putting training courses like this up for um, other people to be able to take advantage of. And we also have a partnership now with the Nonprofit Leadership Alliance, formerly American Humanics, to put their certified nonprofit professional credential online as well. But if you have any questions about the City Institute or our work, please feel free to contact me. So what we want to do is talking again today about building these cross-sector collaborations. And one of the things we like to begin with first is making sure we're all on the same page around definitions. And I'll say, please ask questions at any time. Jennifer will be tracking those, and we'll have time at the end to answer some questions. But um, I'll also be asking you some questions, again, as Jennifer said, to fill into the chat box. So the first word that we want to make sure we are clear about the definition of is leadership, because any successful collaboration has to have effective leadership. But oftentimes, um, people have differing opinions of what leadership means. So I want to share with you sort of our perception of leadership and actually do it from the negative about what leadership is not. And so leadership isn't the same as a position. It's not your title. It's not your um, box on the org chart. It is not wherever you may fall in a hierarchy that we see leadership can happen from anyone, anywhere within an organization or a community. And again, leadership isn't the same as management. Management is a course of study. You can get lots of degrees, and management is about how you do things, whereas we see leadership is more about how you think about what could be done so that, again, leadership is not dependent on any academic degree that you may have or even, again, whatever supervisory um, or managerial responsibility you may have. And then finally, leadership isn't the same as imposing solutions. It's not coming up with the answer and telling other people what to do. Um, to some extent, it's the opposite. Leadership is about engaging other people to co-create the best possible solution so that it is community-based and not just from one individual. And so the definition we like to say about leadership when we think about what it isn't is to say that leadership is the change at the pace people can stand. And this comes from research and thinking by Ronald Heifetz, who's a Harvard professor who spent many decades looking at issues of leadership. And we really like this idea of leadership leading to change, but making sure that it is, um, again, change that can be embraced by everyone. And he came up with this idea of the zone of productive disequilibrium, or the ZPD. And the key here is to make sure that you've put enough heat as a leader to make sure that the change isn't happening too slowly or isn't happening too quickly, sort of like a Goldilocks phenomenon. You want it to happen just right. Because if you don't have enough heat or incentive or motivation, change could be avoided. And this may be trying to just keep the status quo. And I actually hear people say, oh, we would just like to maintain the status quo. But to some extent, that is not an effective strategy to advance an organization, a movement, a group of people. Because when you look out into nature, and happily our um, parade ground in front of our building is greening again, all of nature is either growing or declining. It's either living or dying. And the same is true for any of our organizations or our groups. We're all organic. And so if you're trying to just maintain the status quo, 
it probably means you're declining, that you're not doing anything to help grow the organization or the group. But the opposite can be true as well, that if you try to make change happen too quickly, if you don't get the right buy-in, if you don't build your team well enough, that then this um, primordial danger um, complex kicks in for people and fear and anxiety and we have what is known as flight um, or fight and so that's when change can be um, unproductive and people um, resist change if they feel like it's being done unto them instead of with them. And so the key here in leadership is how to make sure that that change again is happening um, in a productive manner at the pace at which people can stand. So that's our first word, leadership. Our second one is sector. And so we hear the word sector, and it may be even some of your organization's names or your mission statements. And so when we think about sector, we commonly put it into two buckets. It's sort of the tax code designation of whether you're in the business, government, or nonprofit sectors, or the um, private, public, or social sectors, or it may be by industry. That it could be in, you know, the finance sector, the healthcare sector, or the um, technology sector, and the issues around sector um, is what we want to focus on today around how to build a team with cross-sector collaboration. And so the key here is not to sort of be like Noah's art and get two of each and hope that you have a cross-sector collaboration. Now this is not about just getting, again, maybe a couple people from nonprofit, a couple people from corporate, a couple people from government, put them in the room, ta-da, we have a cross-sector collaboration to solve a problem. It's more about getting the right people in the room and how do you help them learn to relate to one another. And so we actually like, when we're thinking about a cross-sector collaboration, to break out of the industry and tax codes and look more to an interest-based frame of who would be all the interested parties in solving a problem. And this is an example from Cincinnati where they were looking at trying to bring together a cross-sector partnership with the goal of 90% labor force employment. And they realized certainly they would need nonprofit leaders, business leaders, and government represented. But they thought, well, you know, we'd certainly need the employers. Uh, regardless of what sector they came from. And we probably need some policy makers, um, certainly some funders, maybe some training providers, uh, people doing skill development work, and finally employees themselves, people from the community. And so they brought in their frame so that they looked at who were all the people um, that could be interested in solving this problem and bringing them together for collaboration. And so although our sector designation can be helpful, um, it's not the only way we should be thinking about pulling together people, again, for a cross-sector collaboration. And then there are certainly those um, um, entities, whether academia, um, hospitals, um, theaters, foundations that may have multiple sectors. So you could have a, a nonprofit university, a public university, and a for-profit university. And so again, even the type of, of institution could fall into various sectors. And so when we pull together people from different sectors, it can cause problems because people aren't necessarily used to working with one another. And so how many of you, when you have ever been in a cross-sector collaboration or tried to pull one together, have seen it feel like this, that oftentimes there's a lot of finger pointing. 
and that people feel like, oh, it's government's fault, they're not doing enough, or, you know, corporate is just greedy, or nonprofits are just inefficient. And that finger pointing doesn't really help build collaboration. And we can even see it in the language on the news or within politics that a lot of finger pointing happens. And it may feel good in the moment, but in the long run, it really does not help us move to what we're coming together for. So we'd like cross-sector collaboration to look more like this, where everyone's pointing their fingers to the problem we're trying to solve. So this is not about placing blame. It's not about who gets the credit. But it's all about achieving impact, finding the solution to whatever problem that the group is wanting to address. And oftentimes, <coughs> When we get a team together in a room, it may feel a lot more like collaboration than collaboration. And so think about meetings you've been in. <clears throat> Has there been, again, a lot of either, again, assigning blame or taking credit or stakeholders making sure they protect their interests or it's all about whose voice has the loudest opinion, there's maybe a lot of talk and very little action, and they may very much be informal gatherings, and we've all been to meetings where we've wondered what was the value of our time actually sitting in the room of the meeting. Whereas if we think about how to have an effective collaboration, how do we first focus on outcomes? What is it that we want to be doing together? <clears throat> How are we generating value by coming together? What data are we using in our decision making? What is our action plan? What is our task list to make sure that we're keeping people engaged? And again, this is often needs to be a very intentional and rigorous process. And so that when we look at how do we build these cross-sector collaborations, what we really see is that we need cross-sector leadership and a terminology of a tri-sector leader, people who understand how to work within and across the different sectors in helping to solve problems. And we're seeing more and more of people who have careers that aren't dedicated in just one sector, but they move from nonprofit to governance, business, et cetera. And part of this work is really about building alliances that may be uncomfortable, that may um, cause some adjustment of people's thinking. Um, maybe it confronts challenges in new ways. Maybe there's new habits have to be learned. But the big value is bringing in new perspectives to help change maybe some age-old ideas. And the whole purpose of this cross-sector leadership and forming these collaborations is to help break down silos. Your agency may be engaging volunteers, and it may be feeling like you're doing the same thing over and over and over again year after year. And your volunteers may feel good about it, and you may be serving your clients, but are you really making a big change in the community? How are there other people that you could bring in as partners, collaborators from various sectors, maybe some unusual bedfellows, to think about doing things differently to address the problem more effectively? And so there are specific skills that we've researched here at the Presidio Institute that we think are critical in developing cross-sector leaders. And these leadership skills divide down into three big areas, building teams, solving problems, and achieving impact. And this is a little bit like a roadmap that you first have to focus on the relationships of building teams to lead you to the processes of what you want to do to solve a problem to finally get to the results of achieving impact. And this symbol is actually one of the windows in our office building at the Presidio. We're in a century-old 
Army military headquarters and an architect came up with this trifle window and so we used it to break into our three big areas. And so the skills under building teams we put into green and that's the color of our parade ground, the foundation, the what we have to build any collaboration on around developing trust, managing power dynamics and conflicts, and fostering an innovation culture. And we'll focus on those three skills um, in the rest of the webinar today. I'll just also touch on the other six. When you get to solving problems, that's in the international orange, which some recognize as the color of the Golden Gate Bridge, is this is how we build bridges within our communities among different organizations, different community groups, different demographics, so that we have an understanding of the impact on the people involved. We take a systems approach and that we define our results and use data in the solving of our problems. And then finally, the achieving impact is of our Presidio White. Our buildings here at Fort Scott at the Presidio Institute are a um, neo um, mission um, Spanish colonial architecture and they have this white stucco and so these are your organizations these are what you're building in your community to stand the test of time to provide lasting change or to potentially sunset after you've achieved your impact and you've um, solved your problem that you can share your knowledge and learning use your leverage points and you finally align motivations and values. And so, again, for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to be focusing on the building team section, and maybe in the future, Jennifer will invite us back, and we'll focus on another webinar, one of the other two areas. But again, this building teams is fundamental, that it's hard to have an effective collaboration to bring people from across different sectors together if you don't first build them as a team. And oftentimes this gets short shifted. It feels like sort of the kumbaya work and that, you know, why are we wasting time on icebreakers or why aren't we just jumping into finding the solution um, to our problem? But we found that the, the short-term work in building teams actually can lead to a much greater long-term success and save you time in actually coming up with those solutions. And the very first skill in developing a team, not surprising, is building trust. How do we get to know one another? How do we create understanding and empathy um, together to build commitments with one another? And how do we create a culture of candor um, so that we can feel like we can talk freely and frankly without fear? Um, oftentimes I see collaborations and I do a lot of work with nonprofit boards of directors, again a different type of group of volunteers. Um, and their meetings look more like an afternoon tea party where everyone sort of has a culture of politeness as opposed to this, again, culture of candor. And I think part of that reason is there isn't trust within the group to speak openly. They haven't done the work to build the team. They don't know who each other are sitting around the table. And I think that's true with any volunteer group coming together. And I've always been impressed whenever I do any group volunteering, um, when time is spent at the beginning getting to know one another before we jump into the actual activity. Or even when I'm an individual volunteer, how am I incorporated into the staff? How do I get to know the other people I'm working with? so that it doesn't just feel like I'm an automatron that's just put to work. I was, again, more human beings, we're not robots. And so this building trust is something very important. And one of the best ways to do that is to simply have people share with one another who they really are. And this is beyond just their um, sort of name, rank, and serial number. The um, 20 years I lived in Washington, D.C., the first question anyone asked was not your name, 
or where you live, it was <laughs> what do you do, where do you work? And they wanted to know which of the sectors you came from, particularly since there was a large federal government sector in the nation's capital. But that may be one of the most uninteresting part of someone's life. And so how do we break down, again, the, the hierarchy, the, the, the position um, mindset, and think again of people as people. And so we like to do an activity that we call the stoke, where you can ask questions for people to be able to share a little bit about who they are um, outside their business card or outside their office so that Again, you can start forming new connections or make ways of learning about who each other are. And a simple one, which I sort of modeled at the beginning, is just asking people, you know, state their name, what city were they born, you know, where do they currently work or live, and then just any question you could ask, um, you know, what's your favorite vacation spot, you know, where's your favorite after work hangout, whatever it is to start getting to know someone, again, beyond just the surface. And we found that in working with some of our teams, unusual connections happened. We had a group of 24 people all working in organizations in the United States come together to find out that five of them had been born or had some connection to Canada. It was just a very unusual um, and unexpected. And so again, it's something we would never have uncovered had we not gone a little bit deeper into who people are. And again, there's lots of different ways that you may have found that you've used to develop trust. And so what I'd like to do um, is ask if you would be willing to type into the chat box any ideas that you found have been very helpful in developing trust within a team. Any activities you've done, any questions you've asked of one another, anything that you've seen that helps develop trust. And I am serving on a board of directors with Greg Baldwin, the CEO of Volunteer Match. And uh, one board meeting, we um, all went horseback riding together. You get a whole different perspective of board members from the back of a horse. And I actually have a group picture of us on horseback that I still have in my office because it was such a bonding experience of how we develop trust with one another riding horseback and certainly broke out of the sort of mold of sitting around the boardroom table. So any other ways that you've found that you've developed trust with a team or group, um, you can just chat that into the um, chat box. David, I'll share mine. One of my favorites is um, a like and different where you get four or five people together and you have to find something, one or two things that are common among everyone in the group and then you have to find something that's unique to each person in the group. That's a great idea. Well, so a lot of, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say we're getting in some answers into the questions box as well if you want to okay. take a look. Great. So uh, again, part of this is about developing um, vulnerability with one another, and so that um, seems to be how we um, um, deal with developing trust. So here's some suggestions to follow up with what you say by doing what you say, certainly accountability, um, lunch meetings, meetings out of the office, anytime uh, sharing meals regularly, anytime breaking bread, having food together. Um, does seem to be um, a very human way to socialize with one another. Um, um, introductions that include a primary hobby, um, jumping in to help partners with their work, a task or a challenge they may be facing. Absolutely anytime people step up, that shows that they're um, wanting to be engaged and involved and help develop trust. Opening dialogues on overarching social issues that your nonprofit is addressing. Um, and have it facilitated by participants, 
and having that broader discussion. Again, being um, open to new opinions. Um, Volunteer Match actually just hosted a um, discussion about um, how to disrupt the cycle of inequity in the Bay Area. And again, it was a, a great way to have an open dialogue and build trust among uh, different people. Um, being true, honest, and caring, um, maintaining confidence certainly is a way to develop trust. Um, I like the idea of going to the beach. Um, um, I had a group I worked with, they went bowling um, regularly um, as a way to, to develop their team. Um, doing a blind walk, um, again, there's some very specific or uh, a wall climb or ropes course um, that have all been designed to help develop trust. Um, just listening, letting people know that you're interested in them, um, asking people um, how did you come to be in the room that day. There, um, a, a, a favorite game is two truths and a lie, where you come up with three things about yourself, but one of them is not true, and two are, and the other people have to guess which is the lie. Um, and again, uh, having play and fun is very key to all of these, and trying to do it in a retreat-like setting where you can come together outside of the, the normal um, confines of where you typically meet also is a great way to develop trust. Um, even at the end of every one of our staff meetings, we ask a question um, that um, yesterday was, do you have a favorite holiday tradition this time of year of a movie or a, a book that you read? And just have every person answer that. Uh, having um, common agreements, um, other icebreakers, um, again, lots of different ideas. Thank you for sharing those. And um, again, one thing to do is ask the people that you're working with, what would they like to know? What question would they like to have answered by the other people in the room? And a, a game I like to play is called Quarters, where you get the group into the center of a room and you have four corners and you come up with a question with four possible answers and then people go to the corners depending on the question um, and so you might ask you know how many siblings do you have zero um, one to two three to four five plus you know um, how many languages do you speak? Um, how many different countries have you lived in? Um, any questions like that, and that's just a very quick and actually interactive because it gets people up and moving around way to get to know people quickly. Again, all great ways to develop trust and, um, and build that team, build that vulnerability. And uh, there's a lot of TED Talks, um, and Brene Brown has done a lot of work about um, building teams around developing vulnerability and having the form for people to open up and share with one another. <laughs> because when we give people that opportunity, it helps deal with our second skill of managing power dynamics and conflicts. And so that's, again, one of the biggest issues that when you bring together a group of cross-sector individuals, what power dynamics are happening in the room. And these may fall under five different categories we've seen. Um, certainly the position as an individual. So, you know, who has the biggest title in the room? You know, who's the, maybe the oldest person in the room? That, that person has a potential power over other people. Again, it could be the position of their organization or community. So, you know, who's from the mayor's office? Who's from a um, major um, largest nonprofit or a big business in the area? Um, those bring their own power dynamics. Again, these are all sort of based on the business card. Um, you also have power dynamics of expertise of people who may be the lawyer or the accountant. 
um, the technology person. They bring in expertise, and oftentimes that power can be deferred to, maybe rightly or wrongly, um, because people see that expertise as having great power. Again, charisma can be very powerful. The person who has the most bubbly personality or most outspoken, um, that brings a lot of power into any group. And then finally, resources. You know, who's, who's hosting the meeting? Who's funding the meeting? Um, is there uh, foundations or major corporate donors in the room? Or an individual donor? These also entail people having power and so it's not a matter that you can avoid power dynamics because they're true in everybody, but it's how do you manage whatever conflicts or try to mitigate their conflicts as they come up. And one thing we like to do with the group, and you could do with your own group, is think about some of these questions, and I'll see if some of you have some answers. So what's the source of your power, and what's the time that you used it for good? And what's the time you could have used it more effectively or that it got away from you? And so, again, in the question box, if you want to share maybe the source of your power so that, um, again, this is not necessarily your superpower, although if you have a superpower, that's wonderful. But um, I'll show you one of my powers is accommodation. Um, I can give an extravagant welcome and um, make people feel very much at home um, when they come to a meeting. Um, where um, I you know, use that for good, again, is to easily bring people together and um, set a, a stage or a table for um, hopefully open and honest conversation because they feel like they're in a safe environment. Um, where that can get away from me is I can become maybe too accommodating and let other people's powers sort of dominate and maybe not call things in the question as fast as I should. So again, we all have a power. And so are there any questions, uh, any, by type into the question box, any power you particularly have that you would like to share? And so uh, I have one person saying their power is being willing to reside outside my comfort zone. It enables me to try new things and talk to complete strangers easily. The downfall is I can be too chatty and not hold back enough. Exactly, that's a great power. Um, any other powers that people would like to share? David, I can share mine if please. you are waiting for people to type in. Um, I feel like I have a really broad sort of encyclopedic knowledge of um, volunteer engagement. I get a lot of stories from other people. I get a lot of um, input from what's going on in other organizations as well as my personal experience. And I've been able to use that and channel that into creating all of these great resources at Volunteer Match. But it, sometimes it can feel very overwhelming, or um, I feel like I should be able to, uh, you know, it's hard to always have to answer the same question over again, or to be able to find exactly what people are looking for, because I get pulled in so many different directions. So I don't always come up with the best answer the first time, because there's so much stuff in there that I'm trying to, to get out. That's great. Um, two other examples of someone who had extrovert privilege, that meaning confidence and comfortable with it. Uh, another person says, I'm unassuming and I care deeply and try to accommodate everyone, which can result in me not standing up for myself and people walking all over me. Another one of sources of power, charisma and resources, primarily the ability to perceive and understand others' emotions and feelings. Um, it used it for good to smooth things over when I sense misunderstanding or miscommunications. Um, it also to take control of situations when I don't trust my instincts in regard to it. Um, someone says they're blessed with the power of vision um, so that they can um, see further than others and am successful in bringing people together, seeing here beyond the day, um, source of power in someone's 
years of experience, particularly in fundraising, um, use it in their everyday job, um, but it's gotten away when a person of financial resources has brought their knowledgeable opinion and um, someone, a party planner, and uh, helping make people feel welcome. The downsides always get picked to plan all the holiday meetings and celebrations, and it can be overwhelming and trying to aspire to everyone's expectations. So again, this is another opportunity for people to share about themselves and then to think about what does this mean in my relationship with other people and with the team. And so once you have the idea of your power, the next thing is thinking about how can you use it to enable those without or with less power to have an equal voice. And so what's worked, what has it and why, what conflicts does it create and why, so that you can have a broader conversation once you've identified this power is, you know, where can I know when I can use this power to benefit the group and to help other people in the group, and when is it that I make sure that I don't use this power to create a conflict. And again, a part of this in building any team is simply self-awareness. And the more people can understand how they show up, um, having teams do a Myers-Briggs self-assessment or a Strength Finder self-assessment, lots of different um, tools out there, just helps people be able to work closer together. And particularly when you've got a team that's going to be together for a long period of time, whether an internal work team or an ongoing volunteer group or it's a collaboration that's going to take three years to address a problem. Again, the more you can know about one another, um, it's just the easier it is. And then always being cognizant as you bring in new people into the team or as there's transition in team membership, how do you um, get to know that new person and include them in the group as well. So our final, um, um, uh, a final quote I'll share about power is that, again, uh, bringing together a cross-sector collaboration can provide conflict, which can feel very uncomfortable to people. And there was a long-term um, chairman of General Motors named Alfred P. Sloan. And of course, as you can imagine, as the chairman of General Motors, he had a lot of power in terms of his title and his experience. And whenever there would be a discussion of making a decision, there'd be a lot of deferment to his wishes or his thinking. And so he would often say in a meeting that I take it that everyone is in basic agreement about this decision and the people around the table almost like bobbleheads would all nod yes because you want to agree with the chairman. And so he would reply and say, well then I suggest we postpone the decision until we have some disagreement we don't understand the problem. So again, managing these power dynamics and conflict is not to um, avoid any conflict or disagreement, but how do we make sure that that's productive to the use of solving our problem? So our final skill is around the idea of fostering an innovation culture. And I hope many of you may know the myth of the blind man and the elephant, of the six blind men trying to decide what they are experiencing. One says it's a fan, one says it's a wall, one says it's a rope, it's a tree, it's a snake, it's a spear. And it's the idea that um, everyone brings their own perspective, but they may not have the full perspective, and that's why we need to bring everyone together to get their opinion, their perspective, to have what we think of in developing an innovation culture. And there's four pieces to this. And the first is pretty simple, to be open to new information, ideas, and ways of defining a problem, developing solutions. Hopefully people aren't stuck in the past or stuck in their own ways, but can be open. Second one, a little bit more difficult but still somewhat easy to start developing and testing hunches, what's your hypothesis of how to solve this problem more effectively. 
The next one is recognize that failure is necessary. And this is where innovation, particularly in the nonprofit sector, sort of hits a wall because most nonprofits don't want to ever say that they failed at something or you don't want to ever feel like your volunteers did a project that failed. But it may be necessary in testing a hunch or trying something new to recognize that failure is going to happen because it's from that failure that we may have our greatest gain of knowledge to ultimately achieve our goal. And even with a failure, how are you never satisfied until the goal is achieved? And I think that this idea of failure is almost anathema in the nonprofit sector, particularly when it comes to our funders. And I think some more enlightened foundations and funders are realizing that you know we don't want just our grantees to tell us how wonderful everything went. We'd maybe rather give them money, let them try something new, and see whether it works or not, and it be okay if it doesn't work because we'll learn something from that failure that will help us be more successful the next time around. And so again, I think a lot of nonprofits don't innovate because they're too afraid that they will fail if they try to do something different or um, try not to um, you know, rock the boat. Again, they want to maintain that status quo, but that may not, again, be leading us to our ultimate solutions. And so um, I have this quote of someone who missed more than than um, 9,000 shots in their career, lost almost 3,000, 300 games, 26 times missed the game-winning shot. They failed over and over and over again. And so who would want this person on their basketball team if they're such a failure? Well, if you didn't take this person, you would have missed out on Michael Jordan on your basketball team and where he said that failing over and over again in his life, that's why he succeeded. He took the chance. He was willing to take the risk. And so as nonprofits and our volunteer programs, thinking about maybe – uh, your own time when you tried something that didn't work as well as you had hoped it would. And so something you can do with your group and your team is what we like to call a fail fest. Identify a story from your personal or work life where you tried to do something and maybe failed. And think about why did it fail, you know, what did you learn from it, and how to inform how you approached other things. And again, no one is perfect, and it, again, this is part about opening up that vulnerability for people to talk about a failure. But I often find that it helps build empathy because we all have failed at one moment in time. We might like to hide our failures, but it's good actually to talk about them because you realize, oh, I'm not alone in this, or, you know, I might learn from someone else's experience so I don't repeat it. And so, so not sweeping these underneath the rug can help build an innovation culture. And so if you have mem members of your team do this fail fest, have them think about, you know, what were some of the commonalities among the stories that maybe made the failure feel less bad. And again, ultimately, the failure should be seen as a learning experience. And how could they commit to learning together as a team, and how would you innovate your programs, your design, your reporting, your structure, et cetera, based about what you're learning. And so again, all about developing innovation culture. And certainly here in California, in the Silicon Valley, there's a lot of innovation because a lot of things did not work the first time around. And again, this seems more likely to happen in the corporate sector. Um, an old example of, if you know, Wrigley, um, Wrigley Field in Chicago, the Wrigley Company, everyone knows it as making chewing gum. Um, it actually did not start out making chewing gum because it was a complete failure at its first product line, which was laundry detergent. They made soap for your washing machine. 
and they included the stick of gum as sort of like a little prize when you bought their laundry detergent. And they realized people liked the gum much more than they liked their laundry detergent. And so they failed at making laundry detergent and became a very successful um, chewing gum candy company. And so again, you never know where that next innovation is going to lead the work that you do. So we have about five to ten minutes left. And so again, want to see what other questions you may have that we can answer in our time together. And I'm happy to um, um, take answers offline as well if anyone would like to contact me. Um, um, we had a comment about how um, in building an innovation culture you have to experiment and plan for fail fast to minimize losses, then if it's a success, you can ramp up. And so again, think about sort of that worst case scenario um, in your planning. Um, and oftentimes people don't like to think about that. Um, I just went to a disaster resilience summit last week here in San Francisco, and there's no question that we will face earthquakes or flooding or man-made disasters, and ignoring that won't ever help us get somewhere, but being able to um, plan for it. And actually at the summit, we had a council member from New Orleans talking about the failures that happened after Hurricane Katrina, but how those failures have really helped improve the city today, 10 years later, because of the learnings that they took out of it and uh, being able to admit that failures happen. And Jennifer is going to post the recording of today's session as well as email out the PowerPoint slides as well. David, we had a question from Jacqueline earlier. You had your chart of collaboration and collaboration, um, and you had said that data is king. And she yes. says that feels very significant, but um, again, that sort of fear of failure, what do you, how can you ensure that a new idea doesn't get killed because it doesn't have data to launch it or to support a proposal? Um, part of it is you have to come up with your hypothesis and you know sort of state it out there and then see if you can make it true and part of the data is doing the research finding out who else has done similar work what are other people's experiences and that's why when we hide stuff it's um, actually hurting everyone because our work may help really inform somewhere someone else or our data can really help move someone forward. And so part of it is um, as much as you can ground what you're proposing with existing data and then in your planning what data are you going to be collecting? What data do you need to know to find out whether or not it's a success or not and whether you do some sort of a logic model where you're looking at not only the outputs, but the outcomes and the impact that you're having, um, but planning that in the advance because once you do a volunteer project or a program, it's too late after the fact to think, oh, I wish I would have asked that question or, oh, I wonder what that data would have told us. So it's thinking about that beforehand so that then when you plan for sort of phase two or the 2.0 version or decide whether to continue or something or not, it's based on data as opposed to someone's opinion on whether it did or did not work well. Great. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, we've had some great people chatting in with their um, all of their responses today, but we don't have a ton of questions. So okay. um, again, David is welcome to take your questions offline. If you click reply to any of your GoToWebinar reminders, that will come to us here at Volunteer Match, and I'm happy to forward along any questions that may come up. Again, you'll receive an email from Volunteer Match with both um, the slides and a link to today's recording. Um, and uh, I guess if we, we don't have any other questions, David, you can go ahead and, and sure. finish up. I'll just wrap up in saying that whenever you build any type of collaboration, particularly cross-sector collaboration, know it will be difficult and messy, um, but that it can produce much more powerful solutions than staying in your own supposedly safe and comfortable silo. 
um, again, you'll have greater chance of success if you build time building that team from the beginning. And so put that time in your agenda and not think that's a waste. It's actually maybe the most valuable part of that agenda. And also know, again, there's no recipe for doing this. You may have to use your own judgment to figure out what works with your different team, try and experiment new things, but just keep on um, experimenting until you find out what works best. Because I'll share this final quote um, from Henry Ford, that failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. And so, again, I thank you for your participation in this webinar. I do not wish any of you failures. I wish you all great success in your cross-sector collaborations and finding funding and um, individuals that are interested in helping solve the problems in your community and, and bringing them together. But if you have other questions, again, don't hesitate to contact um, me at the Presidio Institute or visit our website for more information. And it's been a pleasure being with you today. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to everyone who participated both um, in our, our question box as well as on Twitter. Um, we hope to see you on a future webinar, either an Insight series or on one of our Learning Center series. And again, slides and recordings will be coming out to you in, in just a little bit. Um, thank you, David, for your time. And we hope to have you back at some point in 2016. Have a great holiday season, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.